welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Yes, hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Alderson, and today we are headed off to the beach. And specifically, since this is a history podcast, to the history of the beach and the beach resort in a really interesting new book called The Lure of the Beach, A Global History. Uh, and the author, Robert C. Ritchie, is with me right now. Robert, thank you so much for joining me. Happy to be here. So this is something that I, I found fascinating. It's something that I think I and uh, so many other people really take for granted, the idea of the beach resort, a place that you go and hang out, have a great time, maybe even stay for a week on a vacation. Um, what was it that made you actually think about this in a in and and made you turn towards actually writing the book uh there's sort of two things that got me here one is that you know living in southern california and particularly for a while living quite close to the beach in del mar uh there's just one of those things you know love going to the beach and it's always terrific not really knowing that there was any kind of history to it and then uh, when I became an academic administrator, I was always on the lookout for uh, lecture topics. My last book had been about piracy, and I got really tired of giving pirate lectures. So I was on the hunt for lecture topics and bumped into a book uh, that did some stuff on uh, Europeans and the sea. I became interested in it and went on to uh, look at it seriously. I had no intention originally of writing a book. It was just going to be a lecture, but it turned out that people had heard about the lecture. They ended up asking me and I thought, well, okay. But I really didn't start working on it until after I retired. And I had the time that I'd had when I was an academic to write. So out of that came the lure of the beach. Uh, again, not something I started out to do, <clears throat> except that once I got into it, um, you know, my old uh, California self of loving the beach took over, and here we are. Well, and that's that's something that's really interesting, this whole concept of the love of the beach, because, and this is kind of how you start the book, there's the lure of the beach in a, a very, I guess, human way. You, you detail that People have always, you know, lived near the coast and have have interacted with the beach. Um, and then much of the book is actually talking about how we have developed our concepts of the beach in a sort of in, in the modern way that we think about them, specifically that sort of concept of the beach resort. But I wanted to talk, first of all, about um, some of the ways in which we've interacted with that sort of beach concept uh, and it wasn't always about leisure. It, it was in, in some ways a very practical thing that, that brought people to the beach. Yeah, and again, it is something that begins in the 18th century and uh, it's therapeutic. You know, people are used to going to spas and, and let's just say Britain, um, Bath and Tunbridge Wells and getting a cure by contact with mineral water. And suddenly in the early 18th century, a couple of physicians write books that, well, cold water is wonderful, but, you know, salt water is quite good. So before you know it, you know, people, oh, okay, uh, if it's therapeutic, let's do it. And in the uh, 1730s at Brighton and Scarborough, uh, Margate, all of a sudden people start going to the beach. But okay, well, having made up your mind to do that, then how are you going to do it? What's what's the routine to get the proper therapeutic exercise? I thought it was really funny at, uh, at just some of the visuals uh, that you would get because when it was this kind of treatment rather than a leisure activity, um, you you had, there was, you'd be sort of dipped in the water and it was, it was, it almost it did feel kind of quasi medical, but can you just explain a little bit as to how you know if I was a, a a noble person or just someone who wanted those restorative properties, how exactly I would go about doing that? Because it's not like I would just uh, you know get in my swimsuit and jump in like we do today. Yeah, well, there's a gender difference. 
Um, if you're an aristocratic lady and you go to the beach, uh, there's no such thing as a swimsuit in those days. So, and you would need to be relatively decorous. You would not want to be displaying your body. There are just lots of uh, social uh, negatives about doing such a thing. So you would, first of all, wear a long gown that would go from your neck to your ankles. And in terms of getting into the water, you would not sort of, sort of walk into the water. You would get into a little closed box and there'd be a horse in the front. You'd get into the back, you'd quickly change into your uh, beach costume, this long garb. Uh, then when you had been taken out for a ways, a woman, and for women, it was always a woman, um, would then take you and then dip you into the water three times. Again, it was therapeutic. And the uh, once you had finished being dipped, you would go back into the little box, change into your dry clothes, and then go out the backside uh, when you got back up high on the beach. For men, it's a little different. Men are from long, long custom uh, creatures who swim nude. So uh, for an aristocratic man getting to the beach, well, you would just take off your clothes and stride into the water. Well, that's not too good in terms of English modesty. So these starts pretty early. How are we going to handle this? We've got the women taken care of in the box, getting out, but the man, well, they're going to have to be separated. The man will have to go down the beach quite far. They can go in there. The ladies will modestly go in over here. Um, so beaches have to develop uh, a man's beach and a woman's beach, keep them apart so that no unseemly uh, scenes take place. Or else you do it by time. The women go in early, the men go in later. Uh, you have to develop a way, and the British are particularly intent on this, of keeping the sexes apart. And it's very different for where you go. If you go to France, for instance, men and women go in at the same time the when the women, again, are clothed from the neck to the ankles. But it's not appropriate that their husbands take them into the water. Uh, if not, there's a, a bather there, a bagneur, who will take the ladies in and very modestly make sure they get dipped appropriately and then brought back onto the beach. Um, each country begins to develop its own way of dealing with issues of modesty. They want the therapy, but they also want their modesty and they've got to work it out and they do. And this is something that, that much like a lot of these, these spring waters, when you're talking about the therapy, it, it seemed to have a, a pretty wide variety of uses. You could, I, I think there was even rabies at some point in there that you, that, that it could potentially help you with. But there's, it, it, it really was good for you. You, you. you could really do a lot of good by dipping yourself in. Yeah, I mean, there, there are physicians who are doubtful about the therapeutic effect of salt water. I mean, it's always refreshing to get in. Uh, and bathe in cold salt water. And remember, this is the little ice age, so the water is really cold. And if you've ever been on a beach in Britain, the waters are not warm. They are somewhat now with the you know, coming um, a warmth that is accompanying the present climate condition. But in the old days, the water was quite cold. And very quickly, people were saying, oh, it's cure for this or skin disease, but it also almost becomes recommended as a cure for cancer. And it's, as we all know, not so. But the other thing that happens is that about the same time as this is all being adopted and accepted, people begin to say, well, you know, it's also the air. The air sweeping across the ocean is particularly healthy. And so getting into the water, breathing the air is all part of the beach experience. And it all is good for you. And again, claims get to be quite ridiculous, but nonetheless, people begin to feel it's not, this is quite nice. Um, it's therapeutic. I feel pretty good after it. I might have frozen when I was in the water, but now I feel quite nice. And um, 
I've also got the sea air to breathe the rest of the time. So it becomes quite accepted. And this is something that I found interesting because it's it's certainly a very um, a, a very peculiar kind of fad at this point to to uh, have all these kind of health um, and in consider all these health benefits that salt water has. But you did detail that there is history to this. I mean, there were at different points in time people going uh, to the ocean. In, in many parts of the world, maybe just as a once a year kind of cleansing or, or something um, to get some sort of, whether it's spiritual or physical or, or emotional benefit out of it. Um, that's true in lots of different places. And I, one of the instances I cite is Jewish culture. There's a ceremony of going once a year to the beach um, and casting bread onto the water as a way of taking sin from you and putting it into the ocean and letting it be carried away from there. Um, there are other societies in which it's felt that, you know, cold dipping or dipping in cold water is a better way to express it, does have, you know, not just a therapeutic experience, but also one that's good uh, for the soul as well as for the body. So we're 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 still in this idea. It it feels very uh, feels very healthy. It doesn't feel like oh a fun day at the beach. I mean I, I'm sure there there were people who might have enjoyed it, but this is is still feeling uh, not like uh, very much like the concept of the beach that we have right now. Um, one of the things that uh, that seems to happen at the start as well is that there it might have been a bit um class related but there does seem to be a, a bit more of a um a, you know middle class and working class movement towards the beach and that that starts as i understand it bringing uh, some of these resort towns into a, a kind of a busier atmosphere yeah, I mean, as long as it's um, hard to get to the beach, and for a long while it is hard to get to the beach, it's really an aristocratic endeavor. You've got to have a coach. You've, you've got to have a uh, coachman. You know, you've got to have horses. All of this is very expensive to maintain. The big difference comes in the 19th century when the railway comes along, and the railway lines you know, begin to run tracks out to... Uh, beaches like Brighton in the south of England, um, and there's two effects, one of which is that it's a lot quicker to get to the beach with the railway, but also the railway makes it possible for, as you say, middle-class people to go to the beach, and even on special occasions, there would be a special train put together, very cheap fares, or maybe the employer would pay for it and take all the workers to the beach for a day, and uh, they would, if they wanted to, go into the water. There comes to be issues of you know, working class people particularly because there's a whole culture, particularly in the west of England, the west of, of France, of people going to the beach simply taking off their clothes and walking in, uh, no gender separation. Uh, so that begins to introduce new elements into the beach, but it's certainly socially it becomes much more diverse. The uh, resorts have to begin developing facilities for these folks, not just fancy digs for the aristocrats, but you know places where ordinary people can stay. And then one of the other things that's going on in the 19th century is slowly but surely, it's legislated that people get paid holidays. And once you've got a paid holiday, well, then you have an option. You can go to the beach. Uh, you might go elsewhere but you would also go to the beach and it becomes ever more common for people to go and the resorts get bigger. They offer more diversity in terms of facilities. Um, and one of the things that also slowly gets introduced is recreation, swimming, dancing, all sorts of other things go on at the beach that uh, fill the time. Because if you're only gonna go in and for a therapeutic uh, moment, it's going to be over fairly quickly. Three dips, you're in, you're out. You've still got 23 hours on your hands. 
And it's one thing for aristocrats just to sort of set up a Jane Austen type of society at a beach resort. But once you've got these multiple social groups, then some beach resorts will be exclusively for them. Some will still only want aristocrats. But the beach experience becomes more diverse. And that's a kind of a running theme with uh, this uh, this book. And uh, that's something you actually even get to in the in the name of a chapter a little later, who owns the beach. There is a real tension throughout of access to the beach. You have, uh, whether it's the aristocrats in the, you know, the 18th and early 19th century, whether it's the uh, people like the Vanderbilts and the Andrew Carnegie's of the uh, turn of the 20th century, um, or even now the people who buy up the million dollar, you know, five million dollar houses lining these beautiful beachfront properties. Uh, there's a real push and pull between public, you know, access of all classes and types of people and uh, a, a rich uh, class that may or may not want to actually see everybody partaking or at least not everyone partaking in their uh, in, in their beach. Yeah, in, in places like the Hamptons or Malibu here in California. Uh, you can spend $100 million getting your perfect house near the beach. Now, do you want to see people then come and, you know, have their lunch on your beach and fool around? You know, if you've bought a beach house, you want to have access to the beach when you want it. You may want to be able to sit on your front porch and enjoy the view, and you don't want the view to be mucked up by ordinary people having a good time on your beach. So access, of course, in our time has come to be a big problem. Generally, the law is that uh, everybody has access to the beach up to the mean high tide line. After that, private property takes over. And in some states, private property can keep you from getting to the beach. But in other states, Connecticut, for instance, um, that's another matter altogether where the townships in Connecticut don't want ordinary people on their beach and they've worked very hard to keep them away. And it's only in recent years they've had to break that down a bit and it's the law that's forced the issue. But again, in general, you have the right to be on the beach, uh, most places in the world, um, except that the private property behind the beach is another matter altogether and that's where the problems really come. And it, there is even, I mean, there's this part of the book that talks about, uh, I think it was, I think it was Carnegie who, who bought his own island, um, which obviously is what you can do when you're one of the richest men in the world, um, specifically so that, he, you know, he, he and, and some of his pals could have their own little beach. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, as great wealth is created. You know, from the time of the Civil War, there are about four, three to five billionaires in America. But by the time you get down to 1900, um, there's 3,000 millionaires. And some of them, Carnegie may well have been the first billionaire. And that gives uh, folks who are now you know, looking at significant fortunes the ability to, in a sense, make their own world. Who wants to stay in the Northeast in the winter when you can own your own island in southern Georgia, uh, even Florida, or you, Mr. Flagler, who, uh, an oil man, decides that he wants to create beach resorts in Florida so that wealthy people can be there with him. But again, for some people, they don't want to be with ordinary millionaire. They want just their friends. And so there are two or three of these highly developed islands in America where you know it's a private club and you have to have a considerable wealth to be approved to get into the club and some of those still sort of exist now getting back to this this idea of the resort because we've we've got to how exactly you can have fun at the beach resort but that's not necessarily the same thing as having fun at the beach. We're still we're still in a bit of a therapeutic mindset when we're coming to the beach resort. What is it that that starts actually turning that beach into a, a place of fun 
that, that the beach itself becomes the leisure activity that is the attraction. You know, for a long time, you know, if you look at the photographs in the late 19th century, there's sort of more people standing on the beach that are really in the water. And it's not until people getting to the water, getting in the water, begin to swim. Uh, and, you know, from about the 1830s on in America, for instance, uh, men's magazines began, well, you should really be able to swim and make it far more popular to swim than it had been before. You can get lessons of all kinds. It's not that men didn't swim. They did. Now they're just far more of them. And then it's in the 1860s in America that uh, women's magazines begin to say, well, you should swim. Uh, this is good for you. This is helpful. Keeps you in the water. But that also means two things. Uh, you better have a bathing suit. I mean, something that you can swim in and a like, garment that goes from your neck to your ankles uh, and covers <laughs> everything is not something you're going to be able to swim. So slowly the bathing suit begins to emerge, long pants for the ladies, a blouse on the top with arms uh, that cover everything. Everything's still covered, but nonetheless, you're now able to exercise in the water. You can exercise in the water. You want to get out there, jump up and down in the waves, take a swim. You're a man, go even further. This, of course, is going to drive the resorts into the life-saving business and, and having lifeguards. But it's, you know, it's now recreation. And the other thing that makes the beach itself a place to stay longer because otherwise you would simply get out of the water, walk across the beach and go change, is the whole business of sunbathing. And that's a 20th century thing that comes along. Uh, the Germans go for it first, a uh, whole culture of the body and nature and getting the sun on your body. Heliotherapy becomes a big deal. And at the same time, how do you get heliotherapy? Well, you get it lying on the beach. That's the best place for it. Sure, you can go into the forest and run around naked if you want. Uh, but on the beach, you can do it while swimming, you know, spending time. You can have the kids near you. The kids can build sun kai, you know, little castles in the sand. People begin to see the beach itself as a place to spend time not just as something to be walked across to get to the water, but it's now a place where you can for your health. And sunbathing, heliotherapy is very much a matter of another therapeutic regime. You get a suntan because it's healthy. It also, of course, makes you look healthy so that after a while getting a suntan really shows that you've been to the beach. Um, it's going to be a while before people begin to think, well, this is not so good. I've got a really bad sunburn. i got blistered skin. It's not till the 1940s that there really be good suntan lotions. Um, but suntanning is something that's going to keep people on the beach. Once you're on the beach, young man, throw a baseball around, throw a football around. And of course, nowadays, all kinds of things get thrown and kicked around on the beach. But, you know, people have to want to stay there, not just cross it. And it's sunbathing, slowing down, lying in the sun, lying in the shade of an umbrella, you know, taking in the air. All of that comes to be part of this experience. And uh, just getting to some of that, uh, some of the, the, the swimsuit bit, I, I found it actually kind of interesting that uh, one of the chapters even was can a proper victorian be nude that's the name of the chapter which is a uh, I an interesting question but it also brings up i mean when you're talking about people lying on sunbathing obviously you, you're going to want to expose some skin while you're doing it um the beach nowadays has a uh, uh, kind of a flirtatious atmosphere a bit of a you know a licentious atmosphere out there you're you know you're walking around and everyone's in their bathing suits and you know uh young people can you know can uh, sort of check each other out and, and flirt with each other that's very much a part of the kind of the quintessential beach experience it seems like even from the start people see the opportunity for that with the you know separating the men and women even back in the in the uh, 18th century but how does that come really kind of front and center in the way that it is now 
Uh, well, the beach has always been regarded as a slightly licentious place. I mean, the very first beach resort is the Roman resort at Baie in the Bay of Naples. And it has a reputation for being just the most, um, well, lustful place around. I mean, you know, people get there and they just have a really good time. And that always carries through and it's written up and people read about it. But the change, um, you know, in, into the 18th century, even while women have these, you know, long garments on, they may in fact be tossed around in a wave. And the next thing you know, your feet are up in the air and your dress is falling around your bottom. So there is an erotic quality that shouldn't be there, but there it is. And then it gets to be more sort of erotic in the early 19th century. Um, and again, men are swimming nude, but do you really want them to as it's no longer just therapeutic, there's more things going on. Do you really think that they should be walking around? It's one thing to cross the beach, go into the water, get a dip, and then come back out again. It's another thing to spend time standing around, jumping up and down in the water, uh, nude. And so you, you need to sort of separate this out, and the pressure begins, and part of it, particularly in England, is related to a rising evangelical culture that really looks askance, particularly since people are now coming to the beach. It's you know, more than just straight out therapy. You're going to bring your children. And once you get children on the beach, you know, little girls, do you want them sitting there, you know, with men parading around nude in front of them? So the pressure grows on men to finally accept a swimsuit, which they already had in France and in America. Uh, men never really, if they swim nude there, they do it really early in the morning and really out of the way. But it's always understood you're going to be appropriately dressed. In America, some people would just wear old clothes. But you know, nudity is there, but gradually male nudity is brought under control, and they begin to wear the suits, the ones that we recognize late 19th century. You have a top and a bottom. It may be striped, barred, uh, one color. But you know, you're, certainly your ankles would be bare and your arms would be bare. And at the same time, as women are beginning to get into swimming, uh, initially a pair of pants and a skirt that comes to your knees, well, the skirt will go away, the top, well, maybe now it, you know, the shoulders are where the exposure begins. And slowly but surely, until you get in the early 20th century, you know, a, a tank suit that is first off also used by women swimmers, serious swimmers, the tank suit becomes the norm. Well, then all of the legs are exposed, the arms are exposed, uh, may well also begin to show in the outline of the bust. And uh, that introduces far more eroticism until, well, nowadays, with a brief bathing suits, both for men and women, but it's 1945 when the bikini comes along, doesn't get accepted very much everywhere very early because it's a step too far. And it's America before you get the two piece, well, in America, it's going to be the 1960s before you get the two piece swimsuit. That suit, of course, you know, comes to be the norm for women. They may still, you know, on occasion want to wear a tank suit. That can be a matter of design. But for modest conservative women, particularly in Muslim cultures, is the development of the burkini, which again is something that will keep a modest Muslim women uh, private, something that goes to the neck to the ankle. But for most women in Western societies, now uh, you know the two-piece swimsuit is the norm, and it can be extremely brief and. Um, eroticism is the thing. Uh, there's no two ways that you go to the beach if you're a young man. You go for the sun, sand, surf, and girls. Uh, that's you know the place to meet and greet, and it's certainly a place where you can see more of young girls' flesh than you would say in the normal, typical high school. 
Well, and that's, I mean, you know, down in your neck of the woods, that's the, the quintessential sound of the beach for so many people, especially, uh, you know, of the of the baby boomer generation is the, the, the Beach Boys and, you know, the, the California Girls song that they have, yeah. you know, which is the, again, the, the sort of the typical, the French bikini and you buy a palm tree in the sand. This is the... Um, this is the kind of epitome of at least the American view of what the beach is like. It's rather more all over the world now. If you go to a Chinese beach or a South Korean beach or a beach in Thailand, you know, all of these beaches that are international and the costumes may reflect you know, Chinese women tend to be more modest than American women or particularly American young girls. Um, but Chinese young girls want to be fashionable too. So that sort of costume that develops in the West is now something that you can find on beaches, whether it's Latin America, New Zealand, again, Thailand, South Korea, even Japan, another very modest society. Uh, you can you know, see things on the beach that you're not going to see on the street at home. Now you we've we've gotten into this kind of uh, globalization a bit, and it, it's it's important to note that a lot of you know what you've talked about in the book and what uh, what we've talked about here is is focusing very much on um, English and American you know beach resorts and to to a certain extent as well European, um, but this is a, a a concept and a culture that really does um, start getting exported all over the world. And is that um, just simply because of the, uh, you know, uh, people, Americans and, and Europeans bringing it elsewhere and, and them seeing those, you know, opportunity for tourism that, that brings it there? Um, or are there other factors at play? Um, part of it really is uh, that Europeans, Americans, travel widely, travel all over the world. And then again, there are settler colonial societies, say Latin America, Argentina, for instance, uh, a lot of Europeans, not just Spaniards go there and they take with them the love of the beach. And of course, Argentina has some great beach. The water is very cold, but the beaches are quite wonderful. Same thing in Chile, great beaches, water is very cold. These are, again, settler societies that bring the things with them that they admire. And then, of course, there are the Europeans who go elsewhere and want the beach experience and will have it. And then there are also uh, people around the world who travel uh, to Europe and see what goes on there and take it back home. And you can find in India elsewhere, but again, at the beginning, it's aristocratic people who can afford to do it will go to the beach um, and set up beach resorts and bring the hotels and all the other things that beach resorts have with them. And they just begin to spread out. They may be thin on the ground early on, but, you know, Western, you know, there's a culture that has in the movies and television spread all over the world. And you you may not watch Baywatch, but for a while, Baywatch was one of the uh, most popular television shows in the world. And what it shows is a lot of healthy 20-year-olds uh, uh, wearing skimpy bathing suits. Um, that sort of thing, you know, your mom and dad at first may not like you to be dressed that way. But on the other hand, you want to go to the beach and have fun. And sure enough, soon enough or later, suits get you know, more attuned to what is now getting to be, you know, a global culture. Now, you, you touched on it a, a bit, and I, I do want to expand a, a bit more. There are kind of uncomfortable aspects to, you know, to all of this. You, you know, you talked about the fact that there's a lot of colonialism, and it's it's worth noting that um, a lot of the areas that uh, are, are well known as sort of beach resort areas today, I'm thinking of places around the um, Caribbean, the uh, in, in Mexico, in uh, South America, for example, um, or uh, over in North Africa, a lot of Europeans end up going to places like Morocco. These are 
colonies um, of you know European countries. So it's it's not just a, a benign bringing of a lot of these uh, Western beach concepts there. Um, this is very much a a colonial mindset that creates a lot of uh, these resorts. Yeah, again, it's easy for French folks to go to Algeria, French colony, Morocco for quite a while too, um, and go to the beach. Uh, the local societies may have nothing to do with it. You know, the resort may be well set up uh, by French money, uh, French capital would develop the resort, but the surrounding communities, their only attachment to it would be through the fact that they get to supply food and some other services as jobs for them. But, you know, you can have, particularly after World War II, fairly conservative societies like Mexico and Spain, where the governments decide, look, you know, tourism is becoming a really big thing, not just a matter of, you know, the French going to Algeria, but people traveling all over the world. And they're doing it to go to the beach. You know, the English will go to the south of France. Well, why don't the English come to the south of Spain? And so it's governments that get into the whole business then of creating resorts. Same thing in Mexico. Uh, go and create in Cancun uh, or on the west you know, coast uh, at, at different places. But again, it's the governments getting into this and the tourists come and they will be in this place. And the local society may have very little to do with it, again, because quite often they're conservative, again, initially in the 50s and 60s. But over time, as you know, more of these societies become middle class, do better, they will want to go to the beach and they will want to go to their own beaches. So uh, slowly but surely, you know, the turn is this way that even governments will get involved in furthering tourism and if people want to come to the beach, boy, do we have good beaches in Spain. Let's get the other you know, Germans and the English, let's get them here. And the new jet planes that make jet, you know, make travel cheaper, quicker. Um, that's all going to attract more and more people. Benidorm, other places are then created in the south of Spain that really um, are very, very attractive. And they may not for a while have much to do with the local society, except that these are places where people come to have a good time, go dancing at night, swim during the day, drink a lot, create a very different culture than the one that's further into the interior. Slowly but surely, though, these often get absorbed. The place where it doesn't work out very well is where there are very conservative societies where there's deep concern for the display of women's bodies. And this can be uh, conservative Jewish groups, uh, conservative Muslim groups. It tends to be you know, packaged around religion, but they just don't want their women to be seen this way. And if the women are gonna go in, you have to create women's beaches. There's women's beaches in, in Israel uh, that are special for that. I mean, it may well be that secular women also take advantage of them, but there will only be women on that beach. Um, so, you know, again, it's exported out and the big globalization of culture helps in that export. But uh, nonetheless, at, at the various places, conservative women will not be seen in these places and not be seen to participate in this culture. Now, it... it... Once we've we've talked a lot of, about the the history, and one of the things that uh, is very interesting and, and very unfortunate about a lot of these beach areas, um, especially in a lot of these areas that are not very well off, uh, maybe even you know reliant on these tourist industries or fishing industries, and and therefore the beach and coastline for their uh, the bulk of their income. Uh, we've got a, a problem with the, with the sea, you know, rising and the uh, climate change actually uh, taking away not just the actual physical beach, but potentially the livelihoods of the people who depend on it. Um, 
you you touch on this in you know towards the end of the book what what are some of the ways uh, i know that you talked a little bit about the ways in which uh, your home state of california has been uh taking this into account and then around the world especially in places uh, you touch on the maldives that don't necessarily have the resources that you know that that california does it's going to be a major problem for all of us and for a lot of different countries and societies around the world where you know, no matter how you want to explain it, there's no doubt that the sea level is rising. Uh, we can see it in all sorts of places. It could be Miami or, uh, yeah, well, particularly the East Coast of the United States, California, particularly Southern California. It's maybe just only seven to eight inches now, and maybe high tides, it causes a problem in certain places. But if you believe that if the worst comes to the worst and we have global warming that's incredibly uh, significant, there could be as much as a 15 foot sea level rise. That is going to inundate a lot of beaches and, and certain islands that currently have uh, you know, beach cultures. Uh, they're not going to have them because there's no beach anymore. In some cases, it's not even going to be an island because there are certain Pacific islands where the highest point on the island is nine feet. Uh, these are incredibly destructive scenarios, and people are beginning to face up to them. I and mean, we all hope that some way or other we're able to control uh, warming, we're able to uh, diminish the impact of. Uh, our effect upon climate, and it's not going to be as bad as, uh, you know, it could be theoretically. But nonetheless, even now, uh, with what's going on, and we're not really getting a grip on it fast enough. We just see year by year, inch by inch, uh, sea levels rising because the sea absorbs heat and grows uh, with the heat uh, leaving, you know, a lot of areas seriously endangered because they're not going to be able to stand it. And if you, for instance, in the American Gulf Coast and East Coast, when the hurricanes come sweeping in, they're enormously destructive and they will destroy everything on the beach regardless of what's there. Do we keep rebuilding it? And some states are now beginning to say, we really shouldn't be there. Uh, the Louisiana is beginning to look at this, Florida is beginning to look at this, California is looking at it. If you have serious sea level rise, what do you do? Well, you know, over the very, very, very long haul, we know, for instance, that in the coast of um, North Carolina with the offshore islands, that at one point, the sea level was 300 feet below where it is now. And of course, the beaches just kept rolling back, rolling back, rolling back. We now make it very difficult for the beach to roll back uh, if the sea level rise continues uh, because you've got this wall of condominiums and homes uh, right behind the beach. And, um, you know, the sand has no place to go. It just gets, gets swept out. It might come back in the summer a bit, but it just gets swept out. And what are you going to do? You've got to let the beach you know, continue inland. We can't let that happen now. And that's what's coming to be the recommendation is that we move back away, that we leave beaches the space to come inland, to you know, begin to move inland. If we don't do that, we're not going to have a beach. So uh, we're faced with a whole series of difficult issues. And even if all of those, you know, have have some sort of solution, um, there's there's still the issue, as as you've brought up of and we've talked about already, um, as you put in one of the uh, one of the, the headlines to your, your chapter, who owns the beach? And uh, it's interesting how you note that some of this rush to create you know new resorts has left you know access to beach for say locals or people of lesser means 
uh, kind of, you know, uh, out in the, you know, on high and dry, I guess is, is the right term, you, you know, you could say. And even since then, you, you talk about the, um, for example, the, the quote, people call it the redneck Riviera down uh, in uh, Alabama and, and Florida. Well, uh, what was once an area that was enjoyed by, you know, people of all classes and, and, you know, and given that name because of a lot of, you know, working class people who would go down there has now been uh, in many places taken over by developers and mm. has, you know, been catering to uh, people with a bit more money. How, how has that dynamic? And of course there's, there's also the fact that even working class people in, in, say you know the united states are um you know are are making much more than people in some of the countries that they're visiting uh that that are beach resorts how how do we navigate those issues or how are people navigating those issues it's a difficult issue um as you pointed out with the redneck riviera and the florida panhandle um came about when working class Alabama, you know, well, Alabamans and others in the South were making far more money um, working in the, the various factories that have moved to those areas and they begin to go to the beach and it's very much a, a boisterous working class male culture that's formed. Well, over time, um, we know that, you know, in the south and the southern beaches in Florida, along the Gulf Coast, people in the northeast, people in the northern parts of Wisconsin uh, like to move down in the summer, I mean the winter, to get away from uh, the bad news that, uh, well, particularly in Wisconsin, winter can be. So off you go, and as you get there, you can be bringing a lot more money and want more different facilities than, say, a working-class, boisterous male beach might have. Um, there's no two ways about it. If you've got public beaches, you know, with parking close by, everybody can get access. You know, you, you just park your car, you walk onto the public beach, and there you are. If, however, um, the beach is really hemmed in and developers have taken everything behind the beach and there's no parking and there's no place for you to go because there are these big fancy homes. What happens then? The beach may still be in a sense public, but you can't get from here to there across you know, very, very expensive private property. That you know is a feature of life in many places where um, you know, the rising prosperity, you, you can't blame the people who have money, who want to have access to lovely beach homes and, you know, beaches. Uh, they're, you know, they, that particular group in society that has prospered and done well, uh, that can be in many areas of society, uh, they want to have some very nice things. Unfortunately, when it comes to the beach, they're having very nice things mean that uh, other people don't have access. So unless you've got, a, you know, parking lots, public beach, people can get access. You know, developers can come along and quite readily close off the property behind the beach, create very expensive places, and then well, you know, you've got to find your way through these very expensive places to the beach. Not an easy thing to do in many areas. So the, the solution, of course, is early on create public beaches, build parking lots so that people can park and get access to the beach. But if you haven't done that, um, it's going to be ever more problematic to give ordinary people access to the beach. And states, many states have faced up to this and created public beaches. Uh, made sure that people, working class folks, ordinary folks can get access to the beach. Um, if, you know, they don't, they're, it's, it's very hard luck on them. You know, they have to travel further maybe to get to a more public beach than just sort of, you know, driving 10 miles down the coast and there you are. You know, suddenly you have faced with an hour or two's drive to get to a proper beach, you know, for a while here in Los Angeles. 
that's the way things were going until the state moved in, the county of Los Angeles moved in and started to buy up beach access areas, create parking lots, let people in. For a while, it was very difficult to get to the beach if you were an ordinary person in Los Angeles. So uh, it takes a little foresight and some states are doing that, but if you haven't done it, it's difficult. And again, these issues are here and there uh, all over the world. You know, getting access if you're an ordinary guy may require you to drive two hours and then before you finally get into the water rather than just, you know, driving here, you know, here or there, jump on the freeway, 10 minutes later, you're at the beach, then you could drive, get parked, and then you're in the water and it's all done very readily. That may not be part of it anymore for some people. It's kind of funny. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I mean, you, we were talking about it taking a long time to get to the beach back in the 18th century. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's some of the some of the problems are still there. And that's not even getting into another aspect that you get into, which is, you know, segregation and and, you know, disenfranchisement from the beaches, uh, not just uh, black people, especially in the United States, but um also, indigenous cultures, and you touched on uh, the Maori at, uh, at at one point, actually having to go to the courts to win back the access uh, that they, you know, that they need and that they once had to these uh, beaches and shorefronts for very important cultural practices. Yeah, the Maoris are a you know, fine example of this. Um... Initially, Queen Victoria and writing to the governor, Queen Victoria was a great lover of the beach and loved to go and did go all the way to the south of France to go to the beach. Um, but she was interested then in saying to the governor of New Zealand, hey, make sure people can get access to the beach. So mean high tide line, all of that's good. And there's an initial big treaty between the Maoris and the English. And there's a Maori text and there's an English text, and they don't always quite agree, but the Maoris have used their copy of the treaty very successfully to go to court and argue that they maintain rights to traditional territories in which they carried out uh, religious and other practices or even just had access for the purposes of fishing. And they have been successful in getting control of certain areas. They may well let people continue to come to the beach, but they may also close it off. They may close it off at certain times of the year. Um, but it is a case where, you know, a local group, a society, you know, very important, the Maoris are very important politically now in New Zealand, uh, have successfully acquired access. It's not been as easy for, um, People in the United States, you know, there were certain you know, Jews, for instance, you couldn't go to Coney Island uh, as a Jew. You couldn't stay in the hotels there. They wouldn't let you. Uh, one of the most uh, the big hotel developers in Coney Island is a leader of the anti-Semitic movement in New York. And so that's there. That sort of thing goes elsewhere. And, and Jews will have to travel to get to beaches where they're welcome. Black folk the same way. Um, initially, they just go up the beach a ways and have fun. You know, Atlantic City, for instance, where there's a big black population that provides all the services in Atlantic City, they just go up the beach and have their own uh, beach area. Slowly but surely, though, all this is absorbed. And in certain areas, Florida is an example where wealthy black folk have actually bought a beach and control it, um, in time, it may well be that developers will come along and they really want this area for a big beach development. And the amount of money that's on the table coming to the family, descendants of the original uh, man, mostly in these cases who have created these private beaches for black folk, um, the money is just so good that you cannot sort of walk away and say, too bad. Um, there are other places, there's a big example here in California, 
uh, in Southern California, where it's essentially the Ku Klux Klan forces black people away from the beach. Black folk had built, uh, started to build a resort area and really control this part of the beach. Ku Klux Klan burns it down. And the next thing you know, the city comes along, claims it, and it's all over. And so, you know, black folk will find that they have one little space in Santa Monica where they can safely go to the beach rather than having other safer places down the beach. It's different now. Um, that's an artifact of the legislation of the 60s and opening things up. But um, it, you know, for a long while, even if you, <coughs> excuse me, owned the beach and felt safe there, uh, you might not always be able to go there and be there uh, and be a black person among black people enjoying your own culture on the beach. Well, that's just it's it's a fascinating story. And it's it's one that I think, you know, we can all agree that regardless of uh, the the difficulties throughout history that have been presented to a whole bunch of people, um, that uh, there is something great about the beach that everybody ultimately should be able to uh, experience. And I thought that the book just does a really wonderful job of not just expressing the history, but also kind of explaining why it is that, that, that we love it so much uh, and that, that people have continued to go there and, you know, have continued to strive to go there and, and, you know, fought to be able to go there. Well, thank um, you. That's what I'd hope to do. <laughs> Uh, and you can pick it up and check it out for yourself. The book is The Lure of the Beach, a global history, a fascinating story of uh, a place that just about everybody uh, wants to go to and have a great time in. Robert C. Ritchie, the author, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. And you can check out... Uh, that book will have a link in the post that accompanies this podcast episode uh, over on uh, the Ask Reddit or Ask Historians subreddit, um, and you can also find it wherever good books are sold. Um, and you can join us here on the Ask Historians podcast for our next episode. I'm Tyler Alderson. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at Patreon.com/slash Ask Historians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.